you watch people who are serving a life sentence and they always say they never look ahead to the next day. They just take everything moment by moment. And I'm right, right here in this moment. And then the next moment I'm right here in that moment. So that's the way I'm choosing to approach grieving is just being right in the moment and not trying to forecast how I'm going to feel even the next two hours away. Hello and welcome to Grief, Gratitude, and the Gray in Between podcast. This podcast is about exploring the grief that occurs at different times in our lives in which we have had major changes and transitions that literally shake us to the core and make us experience grief. I created this podcast for people to feel a little less hopeless and alone in their own grief process as they hear the stories of others who have had similar journeys. I'm Kendra Rinaldi, your host. Now, let's dive right in to today's episode. Hello, thank you so much for tuning in today to listen to this episode. I am glad you decided to click and listen, and you will uh, be grateful that you did. Today, I'll be chatting with Kirsten Carlson, and I have her on the line. She's chatting all the way up from Ontario. Ooh, I've got an international <laughs> international conversation. <laughs> Since I'm in Texas, it's not, not that exciting. Texas, Ontario. Doesn't that sound better, <laughs> Kirsten? <laughs> I feel like I'm the one talking to someone from a very exotic locale. So this is amazing for me. Oh, you're the one you're the one chatting with somebody from exotic yes. place. You're the yeah. one chatting. Yeah. I'm the, and you're the one with and you're the go. one with the accent here. So that's also amazing to me too. Um that's well, which yeah, but then you have an accent on my end because you've got the out and about and about I do. out accent <laughs> of you know the Canadian yeah. <laughs> So we both have accents, so that's awesome. We're both talking to exotic with another exotic woman, so that's <laughs> I love it from another place with another accent, and so it's awesome. Thank you so much for uh, joining today. And Kirsten and I met through Instagram. I've, I've um a lot. I've mentioned this before in other interviews I've had that. It's an amazing, isn't it? Like this community mm-hmm. that there is on Instagram uh, for us that are in the grieving yes. <laughs> circle or or people that are grieving using uh, Instagram as an outlet. Do you want to share a little bit of how, how it was that you opened your account? Because you write, that's kind of how we connected was I was commenting on one of your yes. poems, one of the things you wrote. That's kind of how it started. So share a little bit of why it is you started this Instagram account with your amazing writing. Well, thank you. Um, I started the Instagram account just as a way to, like I think you just said it, like as an outlet for my grief and just as a way to process how I was feeling. And through that, I just kind of found this amazing community of other people that are feeling a lot of the same things. And I've always liked to write. I've always loved words. Words are one of my favorite things ever. And I love uh, fairy tales and storytelling and I love hearing stories I love the telling of them and it's just been something that I've wanted to do for a long time and then when my mom passed away in July it was just seemed to be a really good time to to kind of bring those um, feelings to the forefront I guess you could say and, and put them down on uh not on paper yeah but <laughs> on virtual paper no, to the world <laughs> exactly <laughs> on virtual paper to the world <laughs> not just to yours <laughs> it's it's funny how how we um now we use yeah like an instagram post is like our journaling it's right? true like, something, it, like when i was in high school it, <laughs> it becomes a blog. when i was in high school it would have been an absolute nightmare to think that somebody was reading my diary and now it's like here are the most private parts of who i am please enjoy and consume it at will so <laughs> it's a different world <laughs> It is a different one. But do you think that it's a little bit because we see now how much when we put something out there, how much that can help somebody else? Because we might, we ourselves might have been the receiver. um, We might have been on the receiving end of something like that in some other cases. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I was saying before about storytelling. I think for me, and obviously everybody's going to have something different to say, but for me, there's two main ways that you can take a relationship from like a casual 
acquaintance to deepening the intimacy. And one of them for me is sharing a meal, like, you know, breaking bread, sitting at a table together. And then the other one is through storytelling. You get to know people and hear them. And it's a way to build bridges and commonality versus, um, you know, thinking that we're all isolated in what we're going through. That is so true. And in these conversations, that's one of the things I, I end up realizing because when chatting with somebody, you realize how much you have in common because of those stories. If we just went straight to just talking about, I mean, we will have something in common. Of course, we both have had a mom that died, you know, so that's something in common. But sometimes within the intrinsic, intrins, intrinsities, am I saying that right? You would like words, so please correct me on the word. Intrinsity, <laughs> intrinsic intrinsic little details yes. what's the word there intrinsic yeah intrinsic. intrinsically I, yeah I, I think I think that would I Intrin think that would work yeah. that would be correct the um all those little details is where we end up finding those common grounds and when we do that it it also like you said the building bridges um I wish we would do that more right culturally and that if we would know that through storytelling like you just said that we could find things in common with somebody we may not even think we have anything in common with yeah. it would be a very different world yeah, exactly. <laughs> it would be a very... <laughs> exactly like my background I'm a I'm a biracial person and I have very very different like so I'm part Swedish and part Jamaican from my dad's side and then Croatian on my mom's side and it's funny because like living in this duality of like you're kind of part black part white but I kind of don't fit in anywhere and that's how it's been my whole life and I always try to build bridges with the different people in my life to say we're more alike than we are different like you know there's as much as there's a lot of difference and um, conflict in the world there's so much more that we can agree and sit down at the table to say that we're alike than than not, you know? So yeah, that's something that I've always been pretty passionate that, about. That is just so true. And I know that when we spoke, uh, last week, was it yeah, last week? Yeah, it was last, our free interview. I think it was last, it was last week. Yeah, Thursday. last yeah. week when we spoke. Which was so last delightful, week spoke, by the way. It was such that, a lovely chat. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good, right? To have those conversations. Yes. It's like, yeah, it's, it's nice. It makes you also feel when you come into the podcast and like, oh, we've already chatted. Yeah. We already know each other. So it's like, I'm like, Sometimes it's a good thing and sometimes it's not because then, then I'm like, I already know the story. I'm like, what if I, you know, maybe I don't need to have everybody else and the, the listeners, you know, get to hear every detail I already exactly. know. Exactly. <laughs> so, I know with, in that conversation, you mentioned a lot how even um, in your job now with the people that you work with, that now that you've experienced this process of grief, how that's even become a bridge there conversation. So let's talk a little bit about uh, your mom's passing. Would you like to share the circumstances of her, of her passing? Sure. So, a little bit and what happened. So my mom was, um, my mom's had a lot of health issues over the years. So it's not like she was in the best of health when she passed away. But it was definitely unexpected and, you know, it, it wasn't, it was, we, none of us saw it coming when it did. So over the years, she's been in the hospital for, you know, multiple things. And, you know, I remember one morning getting called like five in the morning to come down to her place to bring her to the hospital because she was vomiting blood. And like, we're not talking about bloody vomit. We're talking about like, it was something out of a horror movie where it was just blood gushing out of her mouth. And in all of these health crises that she faced, I always thought, okay, this is it, right? But she would always make this turnaround. She was a woman of immense will and strength and character, and she just always came through it with flying colors. And so I would say for the past seven or eight months, she was facing these really crippling stomach pains. And the ironic thing is, it's not funny, but it is ironic. Then it, every time in the past, like I said, I thought, okay, this is it. This is, this is what's going to be the end. Right. Um, I didn't have that feeling. So I thought, okay, well, it's an ulcer because they told her she had ulcers. She went for colonoscopies and endoscopies and scans and every medical test that you can think of. And they kept coming back and saying, there's nothing there. Like we can't find anything wrong with you. And with every test saying that she was fine, she was getting more and more frustrated because she was like, I'm not imagining this. Like I'm in, like it feels, she said to me, she was like, Amy, I feel like I'm in labor, but also with a hot poker stuck through my stomach and it's excruciating. 
And so I guess it was, so she passed away July 2nd. So I guess like, you know, closer to the middle of June, she went in the hospital again. They did more tests, couldn't find anything. And then finally the morning that she went in for the last time, um, my sister called me and said, so they finally figured out what it is. Um, part of her colon is dead because it hasn't gotten any circulation at all. And um, it's uh, it needs to be removed. So we went to the hospital thinking that she was going to have a surgery. And we actually had like a, I have two sisters, two older sisters. And we had this very rushed telephone conference saying, are we going to say yes or no to surgery? Because they said it only has a 20% chance of success. And we all decided mom's a fighter. She's always wanted um, to fight with everything in her to give her the best chance at living. She was always very passionate about where there's life, there's hope. That was always her thing. So I get to the hospital and even amidst all this COVID madness, my sister was able to get us all in. And I thought, Kendra, like I thought we were there to see my mom into surgery like usual. And when I got there, my sister said, so the plan has changed. And I said, okay. And she said, they're putting her in palliative care. There's oh nothing they can do for her. And it didn't absorb for me. So I was just like, okay. And I've worked in a nursing home before. So I know what palliative care means. I know the weight of those words and what they carry, but it didn't re register for me. And I was like, okay, so are they going to give her a blood transfusion? Because she was anemic and she was really, really weak. And we knew her blood count was low. And she looked at me and it was the gentleness in her voice that I think carried the weight of what was actually happening. And she said, honey, they're not going to do anything for her. Like they're, it's end of life care at this point. Mm. And so it went from, it took me 45 minutes to get to the hospital because I live right on the outskirts of Toronto and my mom lived right downtown Toronto. So it took 45 minutes for this, she was going to have a surgery and now all of a sudden they're not doing anything for her. And then, um, I was able to tell her she was very, very doped up on morphine and it was hard because she wasn't really lucid. And I told her that she was my best friend and that I loved her. And we, um, made plans for her to die at home. And um, she didn't make it. The very next morning, we were supposed to go back to the hospital. My sister actually texted me and said, whatever you do, don't come too early because she didn't have a very good night. So the doctors want her to be able to sleep for as long as possible. And before they transfer her by ambulance back to the house, right? And uh, so we were supposed to go for noon. And at 10, 11 in the morning, she sent me a text and said, are you still home? And I called her because I just had this horrible horrible feeling. And she said, um, yeah, mom passed away. And it was just a shock. So it, I never really got that closure to this is happening, you know, like I think, I don't think it never would have been easy, but it wasn't a sense of, I knew it was coming. It was just like one day she was supposed to have a surgery and the next day she was just gone. And they said that she would probably have weeks and she didn't last week. She was just gone. So that's, it in a nutshell. Oh gosh, and it 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 makes it feel like it had been like a set like an accident type of thing, like yeah. one of those sudden deaths because it just happened so quickly. So the way you grieve is very different because you don't have that anticipatory, uh, uh, you know, uh, anti you know, type of grief prior. You know, like for when it's a long yeah. illness, you kind of start gr your grieving process at the moment of diagnosis. But in your case, like they, she gets diagnosed for something and then uh, is going to have surgery, then not. And then right yeah, away, the next day. time changes completely. Yeah. And this is very recent. As we're recording this, it's only been three mm -hmm. months Um, So that is, is just very, very, still very new. Yeah. What... um. What do you, what did you do like after? So what happened after her death and now with the circumstances with COVID, were you able to have a funeral? What were you able to do to honor her? I'm not sure no. what the standards in Canada are right now with the well, getting, we, you know, people gathering we or things like that. We would have been able to have a small gathering. And to be honest with you, it wasn't one of my 
main um, needs or concerns to have that closure. Mm -hmm. But my sisters do feel that way. And they felt that we should wait because they really wanted. My mom was all about family and old school, old world values. Like she was a very Canadian Mm -hmm. woman, but at heart she had a lot of, you know, values from what she would call the old country. So Croatia. So feeling like you need to invite everybody, you know, you need to do the right thing in every situation. So my sisters feel very strongly that we shouldn't have any funeral until we can invite everybody who my mom would want to be there. So I'm kind of just going along with that because um, I think for me, it's like she's she's already gone. Um, she was cremated. So we do have her ashes. Um, I, I don't feel that sense of urgency. I feel I don't I don't feel closure, but I don't think a funeral is going to help me feel closure at this point. Um And I remember when we spoke last week and you asked me, like, do you want to wait? Because this is still so fresh. And Mm -hmm. I really didn't want to wait. I I think that because I've listened now and I and I really enjoyed a lot of your past episodes. And a lot of the people that I've heard, though, are quite far out in their grief journey. And this being so fresh for me, I wanted to kind of get it out there. It's kind of like my writing where Mm -hmm. I just wanted to I just want to get it out without a filter, without the passing of time to dull the edges of the feelings, you know? That is, that is so brave to, of you to do. And I know, yes, I did mention, I'm like, did you want to wait? Because we were having that conversation. Um, Sorry, I have to, (laughs) like, you know, when you swallow, when you swallow your own saliva, you're like, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so that just happened and, that, and now I swear I'm like I try to hold my like anytime yeah. I sneeze or anything COVID. I'm like I can't I don't sneeze. have COVID I can't sneeze in public exactly you have to walk with a sign that says yeah. I'm not um yeah I can't have allergies now you know there's no way yeah. like, I can't leave my house if I have allergies because people would think I'm sick anyway yeah. sorry for the the detour okay. there but when I mentioned yes that it was uh fresh because you you don't everybody's grieving process is so different and everybody's journey so different and you probably you probably have experienced this by hearing these stories of people that has been have been probably years in their journey and that are sharing their grief it must be kind of odd to some extent to see that grieving still continues when you're just right now experiencing it does it feel that way when you hear somebody share like if you hear an episode and it's been 10 years or 20 years and somebody still chokes up Mm -hmm. for example if they're talking about it is it odd for you to think of it that it's going that it's basically something that's going to be in your life in one shape one way shape or form it's not odd I wouldn't use that word it's panic inducing to be honest I I I know know, it's not just it's not even just like the episodes that I've listened to I have you know Mm -hmm. a very small tribe of people in my life that mean the world to me and a couple of them have lost um, people who are extremely close to them so I've heard their stories and I said to one of them actually the morning my mom died it was a very beautiful sunny morning and um, we were still in pretty much lockdown mode over here so work had not continued yet and I just needed to see some of my you know some of my tribe so to speak and I went, I used to work at a dance studio um, uh, part-time because my other job is I work in a restaurant. And there was a meeting because they were talking about reopening, right? And I said to my husband, I was like, I am going to that meeting. And he was like, what? Like, why? Like The day afterwards. The day after. No, the day of. Yeah, so. The day So oh. I found out at 10, 11 in the morning that mom died and the meeting was for one and I went to the meeting because I needed to see the people that were there. Cause it's a place where I've always experienced this, this sense of, you know, being loved and feeling like I'm like, I belong, mm-hmm. you know? So I went there and I said to a couple of my really good friends, I said, I feel like I'm on day one of a life sentence and I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And my one friend, he looked at me and he said, you, we, as hard as today is, he goes, I'm not going to lie to you. This week is going to get worse. He lost his dad. 
And um, so I knew I could trust what he was saying kind of thing. And oddly enough, like those words were more comforting to me than all of the hallmark kind of sentiments where people say, um, you know, your your grief is so deep because you loved so deeply. Like those things don't help me because I already know that. But I'd rather mm -hmm. hear the truth, even if it's painful, so that I can kind of prepare myself for it. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, I, I work with a girl and she lost her mom 10, 12 years ago. And she said that 10 years after is when it hit the hardest. So it's those mm. things like, it's like it, it's good to know what you're in for and everybody handles it differently. But at the same time, yeah, like it, it kind of induces panic a little bit because I, I, I've had panic attacks. I deal with that every now and then. And the way I get through it is having this mental timer, you know, counting down saying, okay, you can do this. Like the last time I had a really bad panic attack, I was on a flight. This was like after my mom died, I was on a flight um, from one province to another, and it was really bad turbulence. And I thought to myself, I can do this, even though like I feel like I'm going to jump out of my skin. I can do this because there's only another half an hour left in the flight, right? But with this, I don't have that. So it's like, this is going to last, it's tied to my life, you know, it's tied to my own mortality and the amount of time that I have left here. And so that's scary. So I, I am in the middle of processing that and trying to work out, okay, what does this look like? You know, how do I day by day, how do I deal with it? And the way that I've chosen to approach it, I love prison documentaries. That's one of my weird quirks. And you hear, um, <laughs> it's weird, but I really do. And, uh, you know, you watch people who are serving a life sentence and they always say they never look ahead to the next day. They just take everything moment by moment. And I'm right, right here in this moment. And then the next moment, I'm right here in that moment. So that's the way I'm choosing to approach grieving is just being right in the moment and not trying to forecast how I'm going to feel even the next two hours away. So whoa like just what you just said right now Kirsten being that it's still just so fresh you just said something that is just probably the best advice for anybody that is grieving is just really just le live it moment to moment because you really do not know it's not you not even day by day it is literally like it within a day you can have all the different mm -hmm. kinds of emotions anyway right yeah. in a regular day oh. without even have without us having even had a, a a death you know we can still go through so many different kinds of emotions right yeah. we could be angry we could be sad we could be disappointed we could be this so when you add grief to the equation it's exactly that same way yeah you do not know at what moment it may creep in or what in your what in your day may make you feel extreme sorrow yeah um even though you may not have control over the things that creep in and emotions that creep in you do have control over how you mourn and that is what you're doing right now so i want to honor you for that. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I did reach out to a, sorry, I reached out to uh, another friend of mine who had lost his mom and she was also like a family member to me. And I said to him, um, I keep trying to look through my mental glove box to find a roadmap and I can't find any roadmap. So I don't know where I'm going and I don't even know where I am. And he said the fact that, and the reason I'm saying this is because it kind of echoes in a way what you just said. He said the fact that you're doing that and you're thinking about that, you're creating your own roadmap. So I, I try to carry that exactly. with me too in the back of my head that, okay, I can't, I don't really, can't even read this map because I can't see it, but apparently it's there. So I'm just going to trust that I, that I have it. So yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and 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 it is it is very um, it, it, again because you if you if you had a roadmap, but which there are roadmaps out there for grief. Okay, let me just put that. Up. There's certain things or steps or things like that or stages that maybe are out there that maybe for some people it makes kind of sense of saying, okay, this is what I do and this. But at the same time, because everybody is so unique, if you were to have that roadmap, but that maybe that day you did not feel like going <laughs> on the road in that direction. It may feel like a little even more daunting for people that don't necessarily grieve in that, ma grieve in that manner. So, um, so creating your own roadmap of this grief journey 
uh, I believe is the 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 best the best way because it is unique to you. I actually just did. I have to post it, but I did a recording the other day about that. How unique grief experience is because we right. all are unique. So, um, yeah, your roadmap is yours, and that is and and you've probably noticed this in your grief journey. It very different ways in which you're all grieving. Can you talk a little bit about that? How, how, cause you mentioned you have several age difference between you and your yes. sisters. Is that correct? Um, so one sister is 10 years older than me and the other one is 11 years older than me. And they are both from my mom's first marriage and I'm from the second marriage, obviously. And they, uh, we're all handling it. Like you said, we're all handling it very differently. Uh, my oldest sister, is the responsible one out of us and she is the one that is handling this um with details like planning things and she's very much about like you know let's divvy up all of mom's stuff let's get together let's let's like it she's a doer and then my middle my middle sister mm -hmm. is an extremely um free spirit she's kind of like the most hippiest chick out of all of us and she's very very wonderful but wild in her way but she suppresses a lot of her emotions so she's a recovering alcoholic and you know she she deals with her her stuff by pretending that it's fine everything is fine you know and for me i, I i'm a very much more raw person like even I told my sisters I said you know because and I'll get into it later because you and I spoke about it but there's a lot of issues with my dad right now mm -hmm. and <laughs> I told them I said I am going to misbehave sometimes like I'm not going to not misbehave just because mom is gone and they said well you know just tone it down and I said I'm not going to tone it down actually I'm probably going to tone it up so if we are <laughs> You're the rebel. You're the rebel, but not without a cause. You're the rebel with a cause. You're not the rebel without a cause. My You're mom, the rebel was, my with mom a was very spicy. Like my mom was the consummate lady, right? Like you sit with your legs crossed and you, you know, don't put your elbows on the table when you're eating. But also she was so spicy at the same time. And I get a lot of my spiciness from her. And my sisters are like, Oh my goodness. Like my middle sister said to me, she's like, we don't need any shenanigans, Amy. And I was like, well, there's going to be shenanigans. I promise you that. So <laughs> if it, if I'm around, exactly. there's shenanigans. Yeah. I might if yeah, if you're there, there's going to be. So with, with that, then with the, uh, with the rawness, I'm curious, would you one read any of the, any of the things you've I'm written? sorry. Would you want to read anything that, would you like to read anything that you wrote in, on Instagram on the podcast? Um, is there anything that you'd like to share that just kind of shows a little bit of that Oh my goodness. Or do you want just people to go check Maybe, it out? It might put you on the spot. Yeah, I no, you did you not. That, huh? um, I would say probably just check it out because there's so much, I don't, <laughs> I feel like if I were to choose something, they were all from different very dark nights and I don't like they're all equally real but I don't know which one would best um I don't know which one like I could really talk about that would say this is what I want people to know right now you know that your writing is well dark. I I use this stuff to be honest with you nobody there's only two personal friends of mine that actually follow me so I I don't really share this with a lot of people who are close to me because it's my dark space. I call it the well where I push the dark things down. Um, I generally, I think I kind of, we talked about this, I think a little bit last week. If you were to just look at the things that I write, I think that you would probably think that I'm a very different person than I am in person. I'm pretty yeah, <laughs> you're so bubbly. You are so. Bubbly. I love to laugh. No, I love to so laugh. Bubbly. Like I'm a, I'm a. I love to laugh. I love happiness and joy and all that good stuff. I'm not this dark, gloomy cloud of 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 badness in real life, but I use that place <laughs> to put that stuff so that I don't need to visit all of this heavy darkness on the people that I love. Um, and I talk about, mm -hmm. you know, childhood sexual abuse and grief. So those are the two main themes to my writing. And my dad was the one who sexually abused me. And so that has been a really big part of my grieving process because for years and years, I 
denied that, that it happened at all. And then later when I came to a realization that, okay, it did happen, I denied that it could be him. And everybody in my life that I shared my story with, which was only about four people, it was my husband, my childhood best friend, my pastor and my pastor's wife, they all believed me that something happened, but none of them believed that it was him because he's such a quote, air quotes here Mm -hmm. that you can't see, he's such a great guy. And so that made me doubt myself. And so I kept thinking, what kind of a horrible person are you that you would accuse this great person of doing this to you, right? So after mom passed away, I is the same day I was talking to my oldest sister and I told her, I said, listen, like, I'm just giving you a heads up. And this is where some of the misbehaving comes in. I said, I am done with dad. Like I'm done. I'm like kind of washing my hands. And I told her what happened and she was like, huh? And I was like, what, what, what's that sound? And I said, did he do something to you? And she said, no, but I think that there's some bad memories there for Whitney and I also. So it went, that was the, That was the starting point, right? And then from there, just to make a long story a lot shorter, he did abuse both of them too. So he molested all three of us. And so we're talking about if they're 10 and 11 years older than me, his career in this started from a long time before I was born and then it just continued with me. And so that's been part of the grieving process because they're still taking care of him. They're still invested in his well-being, and I'm not. And I'm the only biological child, so I think that there's a lot of resentment on their behalf that we're carrying your load for you. Like, we're doing your share of the work when it comes to him, even if it's just emotional work, like that emotional sense of um, caring about him. And my oldest sister actually did. She got really angry at me. We were at her house, and she said, you know what, like, mom would be so disappointed in you the way you're treating dad. And I said, I disagree. I said, I think that if she knew what he did, because none of us told her, like none of us ever told my mom what he had done. So we all kept this secret as singular individuals. We didn't even share it with each other, right? And I said, yeah. Until her passing, until her passing. It was like a a complete shift of like um, opening of Pandora's box all of a sudden after her And she said, she was like, that's what? Because so mom was yeah. very big. Mom was the consummate good wife. Like, I think I'm a really good server because my mom modeled for me what it is to anticipate people's needs and to cater to people because she did that with my dad and she definitely did that with us too. And I have a lot of those personality traits towards the people that I love too. And so my sister was like, what would mom say? And I said, she wouldn't force me to even be in his presence if she knew. And I, and that's when I said to her, I said, I love mom and I will try to live my life in a way that honors what she put in me, but I refuse to let that be a burden that I'm going to keep carrying because I'm done with it. Like I'm completely done and I will misbehave. And that's where that, that line came from. And, um, Later, she, you know, she tried to pull the religious card on me, which is ironic because my sister is not religious at all. My mom was a woman of faith. I am also. And um, she was like, what would Jesus do? And I said, just stop. Honestly, just stop. Like, I'm not going to carry this. I said, I'm not going. I said, I will forgive him because I know that that's good for me. But I haven't forgiven him yet. I've just started to come to terms with the fact that, yes, this happened. And. Yeah, and that it was him, exactly. and that it was him, because you didn't even, you didn't even know th- how. How did you come to the realization? Like what? Because you had these memories, you knew what you felt. It was him of how you felt around him, because you you were saying of how when you'd see other children hug their dads or things like it would yeah. feel kind of weird to you it to did. see. Because you had never, so yeah, tell, tell us well, a little bit about that. So my earliest memory is very, very, very foggy. And it was me going downstairs one night. Um, I didn't like to sleep alone. So I, I was a very restless sleeper. And my mom was always working. And I went into the living room and it was this memory of him pushing me on the ground, like back onto my back and lifting up my nightie and touching me. But it was a very indistinct memory. Mm -hmm. And I remember the next day very clearly, like we, I was in like preschool, preschool age. And I remember the next day I was terrified 
he was working outside because he was a contractor and he did carpentry and we had a barn. I grew up on a farm. And so he was in the barn in his wood shop, like doing stuff. And I was terrified that he was going to come back in the house because it was just me and him alone that day. And then as the years progressed, I remember him, I was maybe 12 and I was changing in my room. And again, it was just me and him alone at the house in the afternoon. And he tried to get in my room, even though I told him, dad, I'm not wearing anything. And I was like closing the door and he was trying to like force his way into the room. And then from there being a grown woman and, you know, saying things to me, like, I would be happy to give you a breast exam. Like I told you that story. Right. And it, it very, yeah, that, yeah. You had not mentioned the other awesome. ones. So like for me hearing it and I know for the listeners, all this, it's so hard. It's such a hard topic. It's like to even so hard. Like I can imagine, I can't imagine living so, with those so, kind of emotions. Yeah. So telling Gosh. my husband, telling my childhood best friend and, they just all kept saying to me, you know, like something happened, but maybe it wasn't him. Like, and even after he made the comment about examining, like doing a physical breast exam on me, my husband was in the car and I said to him later, I said, did you not hear that? And he said, I did. And it was weird, but you know, he's, he's like, he has MS, like he says weird things sometimes. So at every point in my journey of opening up and telling people, I was kind of met with this thing of doubting myself because they doubted my story they didn't doubt that what I was saying was true they just thought that it couldn't be him right and so the Mm -hmm. defining moment for me was um just before maybe about a month before my mom passed away and again we were in lockdown and um I have um what I call my person (laughs) and my person is someone who's incredibly special to me and we were going to have a zoom call because we hadn't seen each other in literally months and I just knew in my heart, I, t- I have to tell this person, I have to tell them tonight what happened. And we started off with this really great lighthearted conversation. And um, I was just like, so, hey, and I just kind of blurted it all out. And they said it happened and it was him. And I said, how do you know that? Like, how do you just believe me just like yeah. that? And they said, you, it, cause it's you, like you, you wouldn't feel this way about somebody. You wouldn't have these feelings knowing the person that you are you wouldn't have these feelings unless it actually happened. So that gave me my courage Mm -hmm. to then say to my oldest sister after mom passed away that it did happen. Cause finally I felt somebody was in the octagon with me and that I wasn't just by myself, like this crazy woman. And then from there, after hearing that he did it to them too, it was validation that I'm not crazy. Like it actually happened. And the details that came out were just horrifying. So yeah, I I would say that my person gave me that that strength to believe myself. Yeah, that insight, that insight. At the when you decided that in that moment you were gonna cut ties, like when your mom uh, died, that you were gonna cut ties with your dad. Uh, did you tell no. him of the why you were not longer? Okay, so what is this conversation? What has it been then since in the last three months? So my. with him like why does he think you're not contacting him well that's another thing that my person said to me they said you know like knowing the kind of person you are if you just all of a sudden decided to cut ties with me I would break through a brick wall to find out why like I, I would need to know why so my dad has never ever tried to contact me or reach out or ask me anything so He does have MS. And one of the things that was happening before my mom died was he was, and again, my mom was 80. So just for anybody out there listening, my mom was frail. She could barely walk and she was not, you know, hot to trot (laughs) at all. Like she was, she was not very mobile and he kept accusing her of cheating on him. And we thought at first that it was just like dementia, but he went for tests. It wasn't dementia. He was just being really mean and vicious and he ended up, uh, calling her a lot of mean names. And the last time she went in the hospital, he was actually very gleeful and anticipatory. He was like, so is she going to die? You know, and just being really mean about it. And so we were all at my sister's house after my mom passed away and he was sitting, we were all outside and my sister has a pool. I was in the pool. They were sitting in front of the fire and I heard them talking. And my dad was just saying to my eldest sister, you know, she was a whore, right? And he was just bad mouthing her so much and saying that he was 
kind of happy that she was dead and everything else. And this is like two days after she died. So we're not talking about any kind of passage of time. And um, that's when one of my misbehaving moments happened. And I went over to him and I said, repeat what you just said. And he repeated it. And I, um, I told him that the wrong person died, which probably wasn't the best thing to say, but I did say it. And um, yeah, it, it was an, it was a bit, a little bit of a bad scene. And so he knows that I'm angry at him. But at the same time, when he left, he gave my husband a hug and said, make sure Kirsten knows that her mother was a whore. Please make sure she knows that. So he, he's just, I don't think there's any ambiguity on his behalf of, of how I feel and why. I think, though, that he has no idea that we've all been talking about the sexual abuse. I think that's not in his head at all. So when he said that, was that out of his personality or out of his illness that he said that kind of comment? We... Or is that his personality? It became his personality at... The, yeah, it became his personality his? near the end. Um, mm -hmm. The last time that my mom was here visiting was less than a month before she died. And she always felt better around me, like physically. Um, you know, she she was very equally loving towards all three of us, but she definitely drew different things from us. So my middle sister, Whitney, was her her laughter. You know, Whitney could always make her laugh. And Kim was her rock. Like Kim was the one that she could depend on no matter what. And she told um, my brother-in-law that I was her joy and her soul. And, you know, she really drew spiritual strength from me, just like I drew it from her. And um, she told me, she said, I don't want to go home, but your father's pressuring me to go home. And I want to stay here because when I'm around you, I feel physically better. And so he pressured her. And when they got home, she texted me and she said, he just told me that he effing hates me and effing wishes that I would die, you know? So it became his personality. I don't know when that happened, but it wasn't, I mean, I know other people with MS because, and the doctor even said, that's not something that typically would manifest for that. You know, he just became this hateful individual. Mm. Wow. It's so, it's so, um, it's, it's hard. It's definitely hard to, hard to hear. And the, the fact that she had just, the person you love has just died and hearing those kind of words yeah. about her, like, I, I can't, um, uh, can't imagine how that would feel you know that the her partner saying that's why i was asking was that the illness or the or his personality so and thank you by the <laughs> way let me just like it's just so so much it's um do you feel after sharing do you feel that is there a lightness to some extent for you i mean in the heaviness of all this of course and of your grief the fact that you shared this truth with your sisters and now, you know, uh, now that you know exactly who it is that had molested you, um, do you feel lighter because that's out? Like it's not something you're keeping. And I know that your writing reflects a little bit about that, but it's not something you're like just pushing in. I do. I feel, I feel free. I feel like... I gave the ghost a name and the name gave it form. And now that it has a form, it can be conquered kind of thing. You know, I feel like for so long, not, not giving it a voice, not giving it a name, not giving him a name in my life and, and what he did to me, it empowered him even more. And I feel, I feel a lot of guilt too. Like, I feel like we all should have said something to my mom. And we were all just trying to protect her. That's the ironic part of it. But I think that I, I think that she would have, you know, definitely left him. And I think that, you know, we just did her a disservice, not trusting that she could have dealt with that, if that makes sense. Um, but I do feel lighter and I do feel freer 
because it's not my shame to carry. And, you know, I, I, there's never been a point in this where I felt, even when I didn't want to admit it was him, there's never been a point where I thought to myself, what happened was my fault. And I know that some people who survive sexual abuse feel that way. That's never been my inner narrative. Um, my inner narrative has always been, I can't trust myself. And so I've embarked on this whole new path where I'm learning to trust myself. And, you know, even with my friendships in my life, one of the easiest ways that you can hurt me is to kind of call me reactionary and to say, oh, calm down. Like, I think you're overreacting because that just mirrors mm -hmm. the inner dialogue that's in my head 24 seven. I've lived without my whole life doubting, like, I can't trust myself. I'm not seeing this for what it is. I, I'm reacting all wrong. And so again, like giving this thing a name, giving him a name is empowering me to trust myself. And that's been really healing in and of itself, just for me personally. That is, that is just a, an, an incredible way of being able to view it because it is, um, again, you're, you're dealing with two different kinds of griefs. You're, you're grieving the death of your mom, the passing of your mom. And then there's also the, even though you don't necessarily probably grieve the fact that he's not in your life, there's still mm -hmm. a component of grief when you're kind of, ser ser you know, uh, changed relationship oh, for completely, sure. right? And then all that also affects the dynamics with your sisters because now all these things. So there's so many yeah. layers of the of grief. There's the second, you know, secondary yeah. losses as they call it because of of that. Um, but it's also so again, I want to say brave that you in this moment of very vulnerable moment of pain and grief that you still were able to just allow yourself to finally <laughs> grieve <Yeah. laughs> per se, you know, because again, you uh, let it out of the, you let it out of the, of the box. Now uh, in the, in your journey, so writing your, um, your poems and uh, would you say poems would be the right word? Poems, I, what would you I don't call know. Like I think I, when I do it, I kind of think of it as stream of consciousness writing, you know, just like kind of, it's just free flowing. I don't know. I really don't know if it's poetry or not or prose, but it's, um, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's like, I don't like, does it follow the pattern? Does it like, yeah, the one, yeah. two, one, that, you know, like that, I don't yeah. even remember the metrics, of, you know, those, uh, I don't even remember in poetry what it was. I'm like, does it, I, when was yeah. it? Yeah. Like Pento, was it like a Pento? Yes, I know like what Pento you mean. Something yeah. And this, okay. So yeah, it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So sometimes it's hard, but so writing has been one of your ways of expressing your grief. What are other ways you mentioned in at work? Um, cause you have this, you know, persona that you have to be when you work, you work in customer service. So what is it, how is it for you? Like when you're at work and having to be on mm -hmm. per se, you know, like happy, you go lucky when you're going through so much inside. It's, it's been challenging, especially because the place where I work, it's very, it's a small town. It's a small community. We have a lot of regulars and I'm a very, very private individual. I don't let a lot of people into my inner world and what I'm going through, but nobody else that I work with is like that. So literally I, I went back to work less than a week after my mom died and I was assaulted right away with questions about her and they didn't know she had died. So that kind of made it worse. They're like, we heard your mom's in the hospital. How's she doing? So I would have to <laughs> smile through it all and say, she actually passed away. And so now it's awkward for you and me. <laughs> I didn't say that, but this is what's going through my head. Mm. Um, so yeah, that has been a challenge, but uh, kind of blessings in disguise with everything happening with COVID our shifts are all really reduced. So I haven't been working as much as I used to. So I average two to three shifts a week versus the five that I used to work. So that's been good. So I would say that the other ways that I kind of manage is I really lean heavily on the people that I love and that the people that I know love me. And um, they've been incredible. Like I don't think, like we talked a little bit about the gratitude piece last week. 
And that's the number one thing that I can say. I'm so grateful for the people in my life because I wouldn't, I don't know how I'd be standing right now without them, in all honesty, checking in on me. Um, I have two incredible friends who come to see me at the pub at least twice a week. And I know that I can actually be real with them and take my mask off literally and figuratively and just be real. And Mm -hmm. they're there for me no matter what. And I do have other people too, but they're more people that I don't see on a regular basis. So I know that they're there and they check in with me, but yeah, it's those, those friendships and relationships in my life. Like I said, my person, just people that I can completely break down in front of and know that they're okay with it. You know, they don't have an expectation that I'm going to pretend, you know? Mm. It is so important to be able to have those places in which, again, you could just be completely transparent about your emotions. And again, especially since you do work in an environment in which you do have to be, or it's expected that you have to be happy and, you know, and cheerful because you're in customer service. And, um, and it, it made us, we were having, when we talked last week about the aspect of having empathy, right. Of when people are, um, when you're being served by somebody to know, like imagine that day, a week, a week after your mom's passing, if you were serving me, you know, bringing me my lunch. And if I asked something and if you would have responded a little bit mm-hmm. less nice than <laughs> usual, um, you know, that empathy that has to exist without us really knowing everybody's journey and story. So I, I really saw that as a eye opening for me as well. Like when you shared that you had gone, right back to work of thinking of how many people we interact day in and day out that have stories that have stories like this, that maybe that day they didn't, they couldn't even pay their rent or, you know, different stories that somebody may go through of, of hardship and, um, or if they had gotten a car accident on their way to work and then they're here serving, you're complaining about whether, you have the right catch up or not, you know, whatever. Well, what's crazy is one of my, I don't know if it was my first or second shift back. I was serving, it was pretty late at night and I was serving these two young girls and they were pretty drunk at the time. And you know, girls get weepy when we get drunk and you know, I love you and I love you more and that kind of stuff. But this was different. Like these were different tiers. And I looked at the one of them and I said, I don't mean to be intrusive. I said, but you're here crying. And I said, and, and I just want to let you know that I see you and I don't want to ignore your tears. Um, because it's so evident that you're here and you're broken. Like it, it, I know you're going through something. I don't know what it is and I don't need to know. And I said, but I just lost my mom, um, not even a week ago. And I said, and I feel right now that like people kind of, I said the day that she died, I was breaking down in the stores that I was at, right? And I said, and nobody wanted to just look at me and see me. Even I went for a walk, right? After my mom died, I went for a walk. And I was literally, Kendra, I was doubled up in the fetal position on a patch of grass in my neighborhood, sobbing. And people were just walking right by. And I said to her, I said, I don't want to do that to you. I want you to know that I see you. And she gave me a huge hug. She was like, is it okay if I hug you? And I said, yeah. And she was like, I lost both of my parents. So I I think that, you know, and that's why she was crying because she had lost both of them. And um, to me, this has taught me like that whole piece about empathy is just honoring the person in front of you by seeing them, you know, because we are so uncomfortable with grief as a culture. We're so uncomfortable with sadness and you know the negative quote unquote negative emotions that we just avert our eyes and sometimes we do it because we're trying to be polite but people are feeling so lost you know and and it just it made a difference for her it made a difference for me and we had a really great conversation after that so yeah this has been a learning curve for me for sure steep steep learning curve so amazing do you yeah. Now, do you think that knowing your personality, do you think had you not just experienced the death of your mom, do you think that you would have been bold of saying, I see you, I know you're crying, you know what I mean, in, in another circumstance? Or do you think the fact that you had just had this immense wound made you be more empathetic in that it circumstance? Made me, yeah, it made me situation. more empathetic. I think... 
it, I love connecting with people. I love talking to people. It, you know, relating with people comes fairly easily for me. But I also, you know, I am, I'm culturally conditioned to, to not want to seem like that nosy neighbor that just wants to be in your business and like, what's wrong? Like, yes. you know, you don't know me. Um, so I think I probably would have asked her, are you okay? Is there anything I can do for you? But I don't think I would have maybe approached it the way I did. And I'm so glad that I was able to, you know, I like, cause we talk about like, I'm not grateful. I can't find the silver lining in my mom's passing yet. Cause I've listened to some of your other guests and they'll say that they, you know, they're not happy that they're, loved one passed away, but there's a silver lining in there somewhere. I haven't found mine yet, but at least in the process, um, I feel like it's refining me as an individual. I think I mentioned it to you even last week. Like I've been doing a lot of soul searching and losing my mom shattered me. Like it shattered me into a million, million, million pieces. And, um, you know, the story that I shared with you about like hurting myself on my own jagged edges, um, I've just been trying to figure out like, okay, what can I turn this pain into? What kind of purpose? How can I upcycle it and repurpose it? So I've just been, you know, the theme that's been on my mind a lot lately is um, mosaic and just taking these fragmented pieces of myself and making something, at least gluing them up <laughs> in some kind of a pattern so that I'm not tripping on them and cutting myself on my own pain and um, getting broken over and over and over again. So I think that was kind of the first stepping stone for that. Um, no, and then we were talking about the the wab the the different the Japanese form of art the the wabi yes, yes. wabi sabi and then the other the kids what's the other one the ki, um I don't know you the, introduced yeah, the, that it's basically yeah. that mosaic like what you just said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But mosaic is a good example too, because it is that it's all these pieces and suddenly they come together into this beautiful form of art and expression. And that's exactly what you are doing right now. And with how you express yourself on your Instagram account, which we will share if you want the, the link and the, in the show notes so that people can go and, and, and read and get to know a little bit more of that side. Um, and again, like you said, it's a way of you being able to get those feelings out in uh, in a way that inst instead of bottling them yeah. in, right? And it just, it, it helps for your own cleansing and healing to do that. And um, it's just, it's just great. It's just the way that you express. You mentioned you were a dancer, that you worked yes. at a dance studio. Are no, you a dancer? No, so I was, I actually You're got hired there, ironically, um, so the two people that I told you come to the pub to see me, one of them owns the studio and he became one of my regulars. And from there, he was like, I would love you to come work at my studio and make my students feel as welcome as you've made all of us feel here. And so I was like, OK, but I don't dance. And he said, that's OK. You'll never have to learn how to dance. And he lied. He's a dirty liar, <laughs> because as soon as I started there, they're like, no, we're going to teach you how to dance. Right. And it's funny because all of that is actually tied into the sexual abuse. Like I'm a very shy person, especially when it comes to anything bodily, kinesthetic, like movement. Like I don't even like to walk across the room. Like I like to be invisible and wear my cloak of invisibility. And like, you just don't even look at me. And so to be in a place where there's mirrors wall to wall, that was torture in and of itself. And then to now, you know, become vulnerable enough to do something that I already felt uncomfortable doing. It was torture. And I kind of like just kind of made some strides to start taking some lessons. But I am not a dancer. But I was taking lessons prior to lockdown. And I was enjoying it just because it was like one of those things where um, I love all the arts and I love creativity. But more than that, I like the fact that I didn't think that I would have the courage to try. So I started to approach the lessons, not in terms of I'm going to be good, but I approached it in the sense of I'm going to probably be really crappy, but I'm going to push myself and pushing myself means that I've won a victory against myself, you know? So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. No. And it's, it, it is actually, who knows? Like what if you never knew you 
you were a good dancer just yeah. because you never tried. You know what I mean? Like, what if, what if this is like this hidden talent that you didn't even know <laughs> Spoiler you alert, had? I'm a good dancer, but yes, never... I, understand, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gifted but... in being clumsy. I can trip on my own bare feet. So <laughs> I, am, I am not a vision of grace at all in any way. <laughs> No, but it's still like, you know, it's everybody finds different ways of getting yes. of expressing yes. their grief. You have yes. found it through writing. Others might find it. There was another guest I had dances yes. the way that she was, you know, she travels her grief through dance. So everybody finds a way and art, art ends up being one of those venues in which a lot, you know, music, uh, you know, again, just different, different ways can be a tool and for you, it's been the writing, it's been the talking to your people, to the people that are close to you, being able to express yourself with them honestly and candidly about all your emotions. Um, and that is just so important. And again, like you said, even though it's been very recent since this happened, and who knows, we may have a, an interview a year from now and see what how your grief has changed then and your grief journey and the mm -hmm. gratitude maybe a year down the line, because you did say that there's been some things you're grateful. I would say that for sure, the fact that the gratitude of now that experience being the catalyst for you to be free from this story that you thought was not even real or it yeah. was real, but yeah. didn't those different transitions, start, you know, yeah, those different transitions yourself, in the story. Yeah. Didn't, yeah. Yeah, that now you're like, okay, now I can actually trust, my, I can start trusting myself again because I yes. was right all these years. What I thought had happened had, and now I can start this journey of relearning to trust yeah. me and to trust my intuition and to trust my gut and to trust, you know, that what my thoughts are real, you know? Um, so that in itself is a, a big gratitude component uh for sure and again that's just the beginning of things to come uh but you are in that gray in between yeah. as we call in the, in the podcast the gray in between right now it feels very and gray. i'm just so grateful that we can, it's gray and and like you said and in your and in your writing sometimes really like dark and it's it's so true uh, grief can be very isolating and um it's lonely and again it especially it is lonely, yeah. and especially when you grieve, everybody does grieve in very differently. It can be very um, lonely not being able to express it in the same way as your sisters or you know or your husband or this. You know what I mean? Like because everybody grieves differently. Um, so thank you, thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. I was sharing. I was shocked when you asked me. I was like, oh my goodness, like this is this is delightful. So yeah, thank you for having me. I'm so I'm so grateful that you accepted and um, and sharing and having the courage to also share this other side of your of your journey. Um, and I hope that we continue to see all these amazing things that are going to come from this now Kirsten trusting herself <laughs> and this walking into the world, uh, walking differently into, li you know, into life and, and, and eventually walking in front of, of a mirror, feeling confident and secure into who she is. And uh, I, I know that that is the path that you are embarking in. Well, thank you very so. much. <laughs> I <Thank> hope so. <laughs> Thank you again so much for choosing to listen today. I hope that you can take away a few nuggets from today's episode that can bring you comfort in your times of grief. If so, it would mean so much to me if you would rate and comment on this episode. And if you feel inspired in some way to share it with someone who may need to hear this, please do so. Also, if you or someone you know has a story of grief and gratitude that should be shared so that others can be inspired as well, please reach out to me. And thanks once again for tuning in to Grief, 
Gratitude and the Gray in Between podcast. Have a beautiful day.